This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at VAChamber.com. Virginia hospitals and health systems provide jobs. They support our economy and promote public health. Local hospitals are always open to help people with unexpected health needs. Having a stable health care network is vital. Virginia hospitals are our lifeline. I just received a letter from a student who thanked me for instilling the love of math in him. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association. Because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. week in Richmond. This past November there were seven new members elected to the Senate of Virginia, 11 new members elected to the to the House, and we are privileged today to have two of the 18 as, as guests. And very much appreciate your being on this week in Richmond to help our viewers around the Commonwealth get acquainted with you. They know you if, you, if, they're, if you're from their district, they know you, That's but this right. will help others. Delegate-elect Lusherish Aird, and Senator-elect Glenn Sturdivant. We appreciate both of you being on. Thanks, you both represent a little bit of Chesterfield, but not the same part, but then right. Powhatan, right. part of Chesterfield, part of Richmond, and yours all of Petersburg. All of Petersburg, uh, a little bit, uh, a few wards in Hopewell, uh, some of Dinwiddie, uh, parts of Prince George, and Atrick and Matoka of Chesterfield. Yes, yes, yes. So you've got a, a portion of several <laughs> counties there that, that uh, somewhat around Petersburg. That's exactly so right. Pre appreciate you both being on. Uh, among the matters that you share in common is a, a real passion and interest in education. And I That's thought we right. would start the conversation there, then we can talk about your legislation, about other issues that you'd want to, to talk about. Uh, Glenn, why don't yeah. you start sure. since, yeah. since at the time that we're having this conversation, and at the time that some of our viewers will be seeing this program, you are still a member of the City of Richmond School Board. That's right, and have a, a meeting tonight just across the street at City yes. Hall. Uh, but yeah, David, my, my passion is education, and it's the primary reason I got involved in politics in the first place. Uh, my wife is a school teacher. She teaches first grade in Chesterfield. We've got three young kids. Um, and was really focusing on their futures that motivated me in 2012 to get involved and work to improve our schools uh, in the city of Richmond for all of our kids. Uh, and so I decided to run for school board. And um, it has been, a, it's been an honor and it's something I'm very proud of. Um, and I think it's been a good um, preparation for serving in the General Assembly and the State Senate. Um, there are so many education issues that we need to tackle. Uh, to make sure that regardless of, of zip code, every child has an opportunity to get a great education. Uh, in places like Chesterfield, uh, we're doing a phenomenal job. In places like the city of Richmond, we still have a ways to go. Um, but these are, I think, bipartisan issues that Republicans and Democrats, people of goodwill can come together and say, how can we work constructively together to, to find solutions to these issues? And I, I'm in a district where, when you speak of zip codes, uh, having the opportunity to represent Petersburg, there is 
an enormous uh, level of opportunity there to improve education. And I'm one of those individuals who uh, grew up in a zip code, maybe less fortunate. And so I know firsthand that education can certainly make the difference because of the progress I've made. And so that's where the foundation of my passion for education comes from. And I want to be someone who definitely advocates to make sure others experience that. Uh, and working in higher ed right now, at a uh, college, also just making sure that once you have that strong foundation that you can continue on, uh, and if that is at a uh, higher education institution, that it's affordable. And so all of those things married together sort of make up that passion as well. We were having a conversation before we started this one about the time when you were a student at That's Virginia exactly State right. and then got some of your first experience here in this General Assembly building. That's It's interesting because uh, I did work as an intern for then uh, Senator Dance, or then Delegate, Delegate Dance, yeah, excuse right. me, uh, in 2006 while I was certainly just a sophomore at Virginia State and that opportunity was eye-opening and since then I've kept my foot in the game a little bit and uh, here we are today. Uh, I don't think at that time I would have expected to be here as a delegate but it's certainly an honor and I believe that began that path for me. And, and then after graduation, the serving as so, her chief of staff. Yeah, right? so I started out as just an intern, and then I uh, went on to complete school. Uh, once I graduated, I happened to stumble upon an opportunity to be her chief of staff, and I was in that role for almost five years. And so that certainly exposed me to a lot of what I'll be experiencing firsthand this time around. You know, in the elections that took place this past year, you each you had unique and different experiences. Yours was an experience of <laughs> getting the primary nomination as, exactly as one right. of five. That was my election, right. really. Yeah. So uh, several people uh, competing in that race, and you know, a lot of emotion, a lot of passion, but just certainly taking all my experience, not just having been uh, at the General Assembly as a chief of staff, but my nearly ten years in the city of Petersburg and in the Tri Cities region have great familiarity with some of the uh, opportunities that exist and what people's concerns are and so just use those and try to communicate them to the best of my advantage. So after the primary you were the only candidate on the I ballot. I was, and I now, was. And in, con <laughs> and in contrast, Glenn, if I'm recalling right, you didn't have a primary opponent. That, but, uh, that's, well, there were a couple of uh, primary opponents initially who, uh, who, kind of who Bowed out, bowed dropped out, out. so it um, left, left you. But but then you had one of the most closely watched, absolutely. and and probably one of the most expensive <laughs> Senate races uh, this past election cycle. Yeah, I thought it was uh, it was a great race. Um, in, uh, Mr. Gecker, the, the gentleman I ran against, is a, a great public servant. Served in Chesterfield for many years and done a lot of good work. Um, and we had a, a, a good debate and, and a, a long, hard-fought campaign. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, I think it's, it's an opportunity for all of us to, to move forward. Um, but it, it was good, I think, to have that, that debate and talk about important issues and, and what's on the mind of uh, voters in this area. For the viewers around, around the Commonwealth who are trying to place who you're, who you're replacing, they know the name of John Watkins. And, and they know his long time of service, and sure. so it's it's that Senate seat. That's right, and um, it, it's an honor to have been endorsed by Senator Watkins. Um, I, I consider him a, a good friend and a resource, and somebody that I meet with and talk with on a pretty regular basis, uh, talking over issues, uh, what's coming up in the General Assembly, um, and and he's been a a phenomenal resource uh, throughout the campaign and, and going forward. And your particular seat, uh, Delegate Preston, was in for one term, but but it, it seems like it was the Rosalind Dance seat <laughs> That's for exactly a long time. Right. So that but, uh, for the, for the viewers. I'm in passing, it's oh, you're taking Rosalind Dance's old seat, but certainly uh, Delegate Preston was there uh, for one term. So yes. absolutely, a lot of uh, a lot of history there, and big shoes to fill. I certainly know that. Let's, let's get into some other issues, and and I know that jobs are important in both of your districts. Uh, Job creation, I know, is one of the matters that you campaigned on, and, right. and now the campaign's over, so now it's right. a matter of working on. That's exactly right. Um, you know, in addition to education, the, the state of our economy uh, was one of the driving forces that, that um, motivated me to get into this uh, Senate race. You know, 
there are a lot of, of Virginians out there, everyday average Virginians who are still struggling in this economy. We've had less than 1% economic growth per year since 2011. Uh, we've had 0.0% GDP growth just in 2014. Uh, we just fell out of the top 10 best states to do business for the first time ever back in June. That was CNBC's annual ranking. And one of the things that they looked at in their ranking when they dropped us out of the top 10 best states uh, was Virginia's cost of doing business, basically our tax and our regulatory structure. And they rank Virginia 37th worst in the entire country. Uh, so we traditionally think of Virginia as being a, a low tax, reasonable regulation state. Um, but in a lot of respects, we're, we're not there right now. Uh, and it's everyday average Virginians who really feel that uh, in their pocketbook and in their bank account. And so those kitchen table issues of um, how can we uh, let Virginians keep more of what they earn to save and invest and spend in their communities? Uh, because in my view, that's, that's the, the best way that we help grow the economy and expand the pie for everybody, by growing it from the, the ground up uh, rather than from the top down, um, where we have you know, bureaucrats and politicians here uh, in, in downtown Richmond uh, picking winners and losers with our tax dollars. So that's going to be a focus of mine uh, in the state senate is making sure that um, that the bills that are coming through on the senate side are, are things that are going to make it um, easier for everyday average Virginians to to live their lives free of of government interference and red tape uh, as much as as possible. And on my end, I think uh, that's certainly. Uh, an idea that I certainly campaigned on and for me it's and you look at the statistics of my district and it's making sure we have uh, not only uh, the ability to attract new businesses and retain the ones that we have by making sure that we have the, mo the best tools in place to uh, attract and retain them but then also to make sure that the citizens that are there that are eager to work they have the tools they need to be prepared and to be uh, able to uh, be ready for those jobs. So for me, it's been workforce development and making sure that if there are training opportunities and uh, different pathways to be prepared to uh, go into those industries that, you know, I'm supporting those tools uh, that are coming forward legislatively to make sure that they can uh, take a full advantage of those opportunities. Secretary Maurice Jones, speaking in one of the General Assembly committees in December, uh, was saying that the number one thing that he hears when he's trying to help get businesses to come into Virginia is, do you have a workforce? Who's going to do those jobs? Yeah. Do you have Do you have a workforce that's ready to do this? Right. Whether Whether it's a Whether it's welding in a place right. in Southwest Virginia, whether it's something high tech in another area, do you and have a? And in this day and age, I think that uh, we have to be innovative about the pathways that we're offering citizens because while you have uh, some who will go off to college and obtain a two-year or four-year degree, uh, there are others who that might not be their uh, path of choice, and we want to make sure that we're providing an opportunity for some of everyone. And so, like you're saying, as a member of the Planning Commission in Petersburg, when uh, companies are coming to the area, the number one question is, who's going to be able to do these jobs? Mm. That's why I think it's so important that um, we help align our curriculum in Virginia public schools with uh, the needs uh, of what the private sector is looking for, for those 21st century jobs so that we are preparing uh, our students to, on the day that they graduate, to be able to either be uh, college ready um, or career ready. And uh, we, we, just like Lushery said, we can't only focus on making sure that kids are college ready. We also have to make sure that, that our, our kids are, are career ready uh, as well. And with regard to workforce training, I mean, our, our community colleges are doing phenomenal work. And one of the things that I've seen in my time on the Richmond City School Board is we've got to work to, to um, better uh, integrate our community colleges and the good work that they're doing into our high schools and even into our middle schools. Um, something that I would love to see uh, happen is that, you know, if a child uh, knows that they're, they're not on a track to go to college, um, but if they can graduate with a, a journeyman's license as an mm -hmm. electrician uh, or a plumber, that at least gives them something tangible, a certificate that they can, you know, graduate on a Friday and then Monday go to an That's employer right. and say, I'm qualified um, to uh, be hired for a good paying job. And so that's what I think we need to, to help align those, what the private sector needs with what we're teaching our kids. Absolutely. 
Well, it's going to be interesting to see in the, in the governor's introduced budget and then That's the right. budget as it works its way through the House and through, through the Senate, yeah. the portions that have to do with education, how much of it really does put some emphasis on career and technical Absolutely. at the secondary level and then at the community college level too. And I think that uh, I think that there's there are funds, new funds in there for that, but it'll be interesting to see how, how you all and your colleagues land. wrestle with mm -hmm. that to determine <laughs> where, where, where to put the dollars. Right. Certainly. I think we are aligned in that. We all know that it's important. Uh, it's certainly uh, an investment that we believe is essential to make, especially at this point in time. And so, like you said, it's just seeing where everything lands in the end. You know, the, the corporate income tax, it's uh, interesting. I've heard any number of people say that they would almost expect someone of an opposite party to have, than the governor to have introduced uh, a proposed reduction. But that's going to be interesting, I think, too. I don't know if you all have individual positions or thoughts on that. Uh, I, I think the, the quarter percent proposed reduction um, is, is a good start and a good opportunity to have a discussion. I think, though, at the end of the day, um, the, the lion's share of Virginia small businesses are not paying corporate income tax. They're paying the personal income tax rate. Um, as well as all of us individuals are paying the, the personal income tax rate, not the corporate income tax rate. Um, and so I think in terms of, of tax relief and tax cuts, I think it's, it's more important and will have the, the largest net benefit um, by focusing on the, the personal income tax rate uh, and, and cutting that. And, I, and going back to what I was talking about earlier with Virginia being competitive and getting back into the top 10 best states to do business, you know, in a global economy, we have to um, compete globally with everybody around the world, but we also can't forget that we have to compete regionally as well. And places like North Carolina have been working very hard um, to enact pro-growth economic policies, like lowering their personal income tax rate and their, and their corporate income tax rate. Um, and they've gotten ahead of us in terms of uh, best states to do business. And so I think we need to be competitive with places uh, like North Carolina because if you're a business looking to land somewhere on the East Coast or the Mid-Atlantic, are you going to pick a Virginia or are you going to pick a North Carolina or a Georgia um, or a Florida, which doesn't have an, uh, a, a corporate income tax? So I think that, that um, it's certainly a good start and a, and a, a, a helpful olive branch by the governor, um, but I think we still have uh, a ways to go to find meaningful tax reform that has a, a net uh, benefit on the bottom line of everyday average Virginians that helps them in their own pocketbooks. So what, what legislation have you already planned to int introduce? We might get into a few of your bills if you'd like. Certainly. So I'm starting out the session uh, so far with requests from my localities. Hope well, they are hoping to make several charter changes, and so I've introduced legislation to do that. Also, um, introducing legislation that will name a bridge in my locality uh, near Exit 45 for uh, fallen trooper uh, Nathan Michael W. Smith. Uh, and in addition to that, I'll have a few resolutions that I'm patroning for uh, one, including for Moses Malone, a uh, NBA uh, Hall of Famer from the Petersburg right. um, area, and co-patroning several as well, doing just the same. You know, we might pause for just a second and let our, make sure all of our viewers know that charter changes in Virginia, <laughs> oh. <laughs> in this Dillon Rule Dillon state, rule. That's right. they, they, they have to come to the General Assembly and almost That's exactly uh, right. uh, get, get permission. That's right. Uh, specific permission to change their charter in, in certain ways. And so exactly there are right. any number of charter bills every year. And yes. some people may wonder, what what does the city just go ahead and do this? They can't. They can't. They can they pass cannot. a resolution, but it's not right. official until yeah. it goes through the bodies. Yeah. Hmm. So what what is some of the legislation, Glenn, that you'll be? Uh, in my time on school board, you know, transparency and accountability um, were very important issues for me and so I helped lead the effort um, to get us to audit the entire school system from top to bottom uh, which helped save us money that we could then invest in the classrooms. I also uh, helped us lead the effort to put our check register online so we're now one of the only school systems in the entire Commonwealth where you can go to our website and see where every dollar is spent and where every check is written uh, and those are good things for transparency and accountability. I want to see those same sorts of things um, 
implemented at the state level. Uh, and so I'm looking at introducing bills um, to require uh, not just all state agencies, but all localities and school districts around the state to have a um, clear, uh, uh, easy to understand check register on the home page of their website so that the media and voters and uh, citizens and watchdogs can, can see exactly how our tax dollars are being spent. Uh, likewise, having um, ongoing uh, fiscal and performance audits of state agencies and departments so that we, we know that, you know, I think we all know that, that state government can be more efficient and more effective and we need to utilize um, best practices from the private sector to help th make things more efficient and more effective at the state level. Uh, on education, um, you know, when the SOLs were first uh, implemented in the 90s, I think there were something like 17 mandatory tests. Uh, and over the years, that's, I think, almost doubled. Um, and there's been good reforms uh, with the governor's task force over the last couple of years, but I think we still have a ways to go. Uh, and so I'm going to introduce a bill to reduce the number of mandatory SOLs back down to the uh, federal minimum um, so that we s help alleviate that culture of teaching to the test that, right. that many of us see in, in public schools um, and give some sort of untie the hands of teachers and give them back the autonomy and treat them like the professionals that they are. You know, the, the, the SOL one is quite interesting Hot because it, it really is because there are, are some people that think that, well, those are all federally required, but, but the, the Commonwealth over the years right. added and added and added yep. other, other tests yep. to that. And I don't think you throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, it's, it is important that we have uh, ongoing tests to make sure that our students are learning that sort of baseline level of knowledge a that we e of that progress. expect and, and be able to measure the progress. But you know, the SOLs are sort of the baseline of what we want Virginia kids to know by the time they graduate. Um, and it is important to have that data so we can track it over time and see how kids are doing. Um, but it's about finding that healthy balance That's of right. having the accountability and having the testing and, and measuring the data, but uh, but not overdoing it. And so I think we have a we need to help bring the pendulum back more to the center. That's on, uh, exactly right. There's so many unique dynamics in classrooms, and teachers need to have uh, the leeway and autonomy to change their classrooms up a bit to fit the student body that they have, uh, especially when you're talking about impoverished areas. There are certainly a number of uh, different things that come into your classroom, but if you don't have the time to really uh, implement uh, different innovative practices because you're focused primarily on making sure your students are prepared for the SOL, that can be a huge challenge. I think there's going to be probably some increased push, too, to try to, to have whether it's breakfasts or to have yeah. food that because wh whether you're talking about inner city, rural areas or wherever, I think that right. in my opinion, the evidence is there that if someone's really hungry, it's hard to really learn as well. Mm. That's so. exactly right. There's been a uh, tremendous effort uh, to certainly make sure that students are eating by way of grants into different localities. And I believe that that's going to be an ongoing um, effort because you just Everyone knows breakfast is the most important meal of the day, and for some, uh, like you said, regardless of where you are, we need to make sure that we can at least do something to uh, make sure that kids are in class and in school prepared and taking in all the information, but you can't do that on an empty stomach. Okay. We didn't tell our viewers, and we don't usually m mention that, but probably up on the screen, one of you is a Republican, one's a Democrat. <laughs> we, we, didn't say which, we didn't say which was which. You'll be serving in a chamber that's it's almost right. two-thirds Republican, <laughs> and you'll right. be serving in a chamber that by a majority of, of the one right. uh, is, is Republican also. Uh, how, how do you, in the last minute or so, how do you see the, each of you, how do you see working across party lines um, I just really think that uh, at the end of the day, people are people first. It's going to be all about relationship building and communicating effectively to hear out one another. And so if you go in with preconceived notions and, you know, don't have conversations with individuals, you know, you have to start with the person first and work your way from there, I believe. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think uh, people from our generation, I think, approach things and, and how can we find win-win opportunities? Um, you, you certainly don't sacrifice your principles or yeah, we won't agree on everything, but but you can uh, you can um, 
disagree without being disagreeable. And at the end of the day, I think it's more important about finding constructive solutions um, and uh, rather than sort of the, the petty personal stuff that you see so much in politics these days. Well, you've demonstrated it today. And we look forward <laughs> to following you as you're serving in the General Assembly. By the time that our last viewers see this program, on the 14th, right. you will have been sworn in on the 13th and That's will be right. serving. So thank you very much, La Charisse, Glenn, for thank being you. on this thank week. Thank you in so Richmond. much for having us. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. For jobs, the economy, and public health, Virginia Hospitals, our lifeline. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.